right, we are live. Welcome, everyone. Um, um, welcome to the Drawing the Figure Today panel discussion. Uh, my name is Brett F. Harvey, and I am a sculptor and one of the founders here at h &R Studio. Uh, we are a studio located in Southwest Florida. Um, we do all kinds of fun things here. Uh, uh, this is my wife, Lauren Amalia Redding. She is the other co-founder here at the studio. Um, we are really excited to have uh, um, uh, to have a couple fantastic uh, guests here today. Um, so uh, I'm I'm going to uh, I'm uh, I'm going to um, be the producer and uh, I'm going to be asking a couple questions and uh, trying to moderate this um, this this um, unruly crowd. Uh, I um, I want everyone to know. Uh, <laughs> um, I do want everyone to know um, that I have a speech impediment. I have a stutter, uh, so uh, sometimes I have uh, I have trouble getting uh, getting the words out. So as I read my introduction, just you know, please take it easy on me in the comments. You know, uh, um, um, we've had uh, we've had some fantastic people watching so far, and uh, nobody's gotten nasty on us yet. So it would be awesome to keep it that way and uh, not make fun of the bald goofball with a speech impediment. So thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> so uh, we will be conducting this panel. Um, oh, actually, uh, let me let me back up a second here. So uh, first I'm gonna introduce uh, our guests. We have Noah Buchanan, who you are seeing on the top of your screen uh, next to Lauren and I. Uh, and then Gabriella Handal, who is uh, on the bottom of the screen. And uh, these are two of the best drafts people around, and we were really excited to uh, 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 get to you know, borrow some of their time for this panel. Um, we'll be conducting the panel from now until 8 p.m., and then we'll open up the floor to questions from about 8 to 8.30. Uh, please feel free to submit questions via YouTube's chat function, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, Noah, Gabriella, and Lauren will first discuss how figurative drawing's impressive history proves relevant and is evolving in the 21st century. And then we'll delve into their own in individual practices and what drawing means to them. Uh, but before we begin, um, we want to make sure you guys know that if this feed gets disrupted, uh, censored or pulled down completely, please just hang tight and be patient. Within five or 10 minutes, we'll have another live stream up and running. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, sensors get a little touchy with figurative art and uh, we've had some issues before. So we just want to make sure uh, everybody is primed for that. Um, uh, so just, you know, log into our YouTube or, you know, find our YouTube channel again, h and Studio and the feed should be back up then. Um, so um, um, I also don't know if all of you watching ever had the opportunity to work with the art model Christophe Nael, uh, but he was a dear muse and friend to all of us uh, who passed away recently. And we dedicate tonight's panel to him and all he did for the countless artists that worked uh, with him and uh, it, it, he's you know one of the most famous art models in all of New York dare I say so uh, you know cheers to Christoph if That's you're right. drinking raise your glass cheers, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> all right so now finally on to introducing our panelists who like Lauren and myself are all graduates of the New York Academy of Art and let's see uh, uh, their website links are available in the description of this video, and we encourage you to follow their work. Uh, Noah, Gabriella, and Lauren, I'll let each of you introduce yourself, um, starting with Lauren, I guess, because she's sitting here next to me. Okay. Um, well, obviously, I'm, I'm Lauren, and I make primarily silver point drawings, um, Again, like Brett said, I'm a graduate of the New York Academy of Art, and I run the studio that we opened down here in Southwest Florida a couple years ago. So, um, 
I'm usually used to moderating these things and not not really talking about myself. So I'm half distracted by the two skeletons joining us and half distracted by being put on the spot. But yeah, I pretty I pretty much make silver point drawings. I write for the Blue Review and um, I teach a lot of drawing here at our studio in Florida. So drawing is something that's a, a constant in my life, to say the least. All right. Um... Um, um, thank you, Lauren. Um, 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 and, uh, now, um, um, I, I, I'd, uh, I'd like Noah to say a couple words about, uh, himself. Hi, I'm Noah Buchanan. Um, I'm a figurative artist. Um, drawing is, uh, is incredibly important to me. Um, not just, um, coming up through my, my childhood doing drawing intensively, but now using drawing as a way to, explore ideas and um and research and prepare uh for paintings um so but i find that the two um interchangeably inform each other uh and are and are um have a symbiotic relationship the painting and the drawing um i went to the new york academy for my master's degree i was there from 2000 to 2002 I returned there to teach uh, anatomical drawing in the 2009 and 2010 years. Um, and uh, before that, I went to the, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia uh, for, for art school, undergraduate art school. And so now I live in Santa Cruz, California, and um, I'm teaching drawing and painting, mostly figure drawing, portrait drawing, uh, figure painting, um, I also teach plain air painting, landscape painting um, in at colleges and art schools throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, awesome. Gabriella? Um, hi, I'm Gabriella Handel and I went to the New York Academy of Art and graduated in 2013. I uh, uh, majored in drawing and drawing is my main and only medium. I vehemently made it through the school without a painting class, uh, <laughs> deliberately. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, now, um, I mean, drawing is, has become more important than it was before, as before it was kind of a little more hobby-like than it is now. Now it is very important to me, and uh, I do it almost, uh, I do it almost every day, The great, almost every day I, I'm able to draw. Um, and yes, I like drawing very much. <laughs> Great. Well, that is an important thing, and I think that's why you're on this panel. So, uh, uh, again, um, um, you both are incredible drafts people, and um, uh, um, you know you both make work that you know Lauren and I love to look at. Um, you know, it, it's it's uh, yeah, it's always exciting to see when you know each of you um, have a new drawing that you're you know posting on social media or so. Yeah, make sure that you are following these two on social media. They are fantastic. So, um, even though I'm a sculptor. Um, uh, actually, maybe more because I'm a sculptor, I appreciate solid draftsmanship, uh, which seems to rest at the center of each of your practices. That leads us to our first question. Uh, when or how did drawing become a central part of your art? Uh, so um, again, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Lauren start with this uh, since uh, she. Uh, is uh, you know one of the co-founders here. You uh, you should be um, prepared to uh, answer the first one. So. Oh, well, um, <laughs> I think I think even I started studying art when I was relatively old. Like you know I I in terms of formal instruction, it wasn't until I'd gotten into college that I kind of realized that was something I I really wanted to pursue. Um, I'm sorry, mom. I didn't go to law school. <laughs> but that would have been a disaster anyway uh but i was always drawing as a kid like i was always that kid who like my parents always had to have a, a i remember a drawer in the house with you know scraps of copy paper and pens and stuff and i was really lucky in that uh, my parents really encouraged um, my brother and I to be creative, you know, and to play with things and to make things and to use our imaginations and i think we were really lucky that you know i'm i'm you know, I'm in my, my mid thirties that 
we did not grow up in a time of constant screens and social media because we had a lot of yeah. really organic, uninterrupted time to to make things. You know, no matter how men, how stereotypically kid like, you know, if it's macaroni necklaces, even you know those things were. So uh, my family really, really, again, even though I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, if anyone had really thought about going into the art as something formal within my education, you know, at least as a kid, we were always encouraged just to, to make stuff and just play. I guess they call it like, you know, open-ended, I don't know, free-range parenting now. But we, we had that and we made a lot of things and it's really fun to see as I'm older what my parents have kept. It's kind of horrifying, actually. Um, and that, that worked really well because again, when I, by the time I went to college, I didn't think I would do anything like that. I, I, it just really wasn't on the radar. Um, I was very lucky to get into a very prestigious school that was not an art school. Um, and so I thought I would do something very different and much more liberal arts oriented. But during my freshman year, I was kind of overwhelmed by other classwork and I thought I'll take a painting class as an elective that'll give me a lot of spare time to focus on everything else and then what ended up happening is that I took the painting class and I was instantly smitten and then I enrolled as an art major the next quarter <laughs> so you know it's kind of funny how that worked out and and then um, I graduated in the middle of a recession so I went to graduate school right afterwards so there was a pretty unbroken stream of introduction to art and and that always had drawing at the center of it. Again, even from just starting as a little kid with markers and ballpoint pens to, to getting older and realizing that no painting was going to work if I couldn't see and annotate the structure underneath it. Um, so even though, again, I was pretty late to the game in terms of art instruction, I quickly realized that draftsmanship for me was the fulcrum of everything and yeah it all kind of kind of went from there so my parents are watching thanks yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah I, I mean um, um i think drawing is kind of the most obvious place where you know most of our start uh, where um uh, it's the most obvious place where you know most of us start it's kind of the most accessible thing and there's something kind of beautiful about just how simple and accessible it is you know I, th I think we all have access to you know you know paper and pencils it's it, it you know those are you know ubiquitous in our it's culture very egalitarian so, yeah. you know and yeah. sorry i keep adjusting my headphones but i'm just slightly ticklish enough that headphones are kind of <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. so uh, i i i that i um, being said. <laughs> Yeah, um, I assume that both of you must have always been, you know, drawing because you're just so, you know, fantastic at it. Uh, am, am I uh, am I right? <laughs> or um, yeah, uh, so Gabriella, you go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I have definitely drawn in some capacity all throughout my life. Um, similarly, in a way to what Lauren was saying, in the sense mm -hmm. that, like, uh, my parents would just get me uh, another drawing pad when I finished the one. So it's, a, I mean, it, it was like that kind of an encouraging sort of thing. Uh, and um, I went to undergrad um, and there was, there, the focus wasn't necessarily drawing, but I mean, it was just kind of always present, you know, for school and everything still, but not uh, as a focus in the sense that I was able to major in drawing. It was like a generalized thing. Then after under, undergrad, I worked in a call center for several years, um, and in between calls or sometimes doing calls, I would be drawing, and so it has always sort of been, ha, it's always had some kind of a presence. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was able to to um, just really do a thing with it when I went to the academy um, because uh, I I did not take any draw any uh, painting classes, but I was still kind of fiddling with painting mm -hmm. kind of in a way. Uh, but then um, I, I'm, I'm not sh not sure exactly why really, although I mean, I definitely have a bias for the comfort that I feel with painting, uh, with drawing just because I'm so familiar with it. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I was just able to just, I don't know, discover more of what I could do with it. Uh, Cause I was, um, I tried other materials, not just pencil over paper, 
uh, which is what I used to do. I discovered charcoal and mm -hmm. um, uh, just, you know, b more ballpoint over paper. And um, um, that, I don't know. I, I mean, it just, I don't know. It got kind of like, I feel like that is probably when it really became like a protagonist mm. in um, just m like my artistic practice. And I have, I hardly ever really do anything else other than drawing anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, I don't know. I feel like I can either, I can both explore and uh, uh, communicate and study all of those things at the same time with, while I'm drawing and then mm -hmm. with when the drawing is done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, um, 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 Noah, I know that you said earlier that drawing, um, you know, for you tends to be more of like a preparatory thing, more of a means to the end. And, um, in that regard, I definitely, um, uh, I, well, I, I'm, I'm a lot more like you in that way where I, I, um, I, it's, yeah, it's more of a means to an end, a form of, a form of study. Um, has it always been that way, um, for you or like, um, um, it, it, it has, 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 you know, I, I mean, yeah, I assume drawing came first uh, before painting as it did for most yeah. of us. And... Yeah, I I have the same kind of origin story that Lauren described. And so no wonder we get along so well, Lauren. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I found it uh, just kind of my go-to thing to do in early childhood. I think even at five years old, my memories are just drawing all the time. And, um, I found it a, a source of, of playtime too, you know, mm -hmm. it was my most um, fun, entertaining thing to do as a little child. Um, I would make these drawings that were, you know, activity drawings and they were story drawings and mm -hmm. I would narrate them as they would be developed. And mm -hmm. uh, so drawing was this magical thing to me. It, it, and it, uh, you know, I really spent more time with that than with toys. And, and certainly with sports, you know, that, no. Um, and I, um, so I was born in 1976. So when I was, so 1977 and 1979, the first two Star Wars movies came out. And All I right. was just absolutely, you know, consumed with, with Star Wars as a little child. But in that, in that, in that period, you know, you couldn't, if you wanted more of it, you know, you couldn't mm -hmm. just go online and get it. You couldn't yeah. stream it. You couldn't like, you know, watch clips about it. You couldn't go on and say, oh, let's watch interviews with the actors. There was nothing to do to consume it more mm -hmm. um, like kids today can do uh, for the things that they find fun and entertaining. And yeah. so uh, I had to create it. You know, I had to make, you know, new, new Star Wars stories on the page in front of me. And then you know, right as that was kind of building into a fire, um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark came out and huh. I needed more of that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I had all of these, I had to go through throughout the day, I had to illustrate all of these things that I wanted to explore in my little psyche. You know, I wanted to explore what, what was it about, you know, I didn't, I wasn't cognizant of it at the time. I was just mm -hmm. trying to have fun, but I think looking back, it was, you know, what is it about the, the these ideas of the hero's journey that mm -hmm. that taps into our inner childhood that I wanted to play out on paper and uh what is it about uh the feeling of the divine confronting the mortal entity you know mm -hmm. that happens in Raiders of the Lost Ark I mean these things really spoke to me wow. when mm -hmm. I was little and um and I wanted to explore that and so um, you know, and, and there was also dinosaurs and there was yeah. ninjas and, um, and, you know, these things just filled up, you know, just like volumes of universes of, of pages, like you talked about Lauren, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the backsides of office photocopies that came home with my mom because we just couldn't keep enough paper in the house. Mm -hmm. So um, I was I was always drawing as a child and and I would go, do it not just for fun. I would do it when I felt scared or when I felt insecure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember getting hit in the face with the ball uh, at Little League practice and everyone laughing. And oh. I I got on my bike and rode rode home crying and just straight to the table with oh, the paper and just drawing like almost like a little kid yeah. sucking their thumb. 
you know and so it was it was a lifeline for me not not just in terms of psychological development but also in terms of emotional support Mm -hmm. um so i always leaned on drawing uh, going up through high school but in in high school i started to want to um paint as well Mm -hmm. but um but i tell you you know and of course it evolves from there but to this day when i uh you know every every so often every few months every at least once a year i feel like i want to check in with my drawing skills and the most important thing to me is making them better mm-hmm. you know so it's i'm 45 i'm almost 45 years old and i'm i'm still asking how can i be a better draftsman and how can my drawings be as good as so and so's drawings or how can i get you know to the next level of where i'm at so it's still um, drawing is this nucleus of of who I am and what I do. And yeah, I can't make a painting unless everything's been thoroughly studied through the language of drawing. Wow. Yeah, wow. that's powerful. And it, it makes sense because um, I, you know, I've, I've made comments in front of people before like, oh, I should take that workshop with you or something. And they kind of look at me like, oh, she's the one running that studio and she's the one teaching and she's saying she needs a workshop, ha, ha, ha. And it's like, no, you don't understand. (laughs) It's like the more you do it, the more you realize you need to keep upping your game as well and learning and refreshing certain concepts and seeing how other people tackle um, problems. There is no finite level you get to and then you don't have to do anything else anymore. It just doesn't work like that. That's right. Yeah. And it's, I, I often, it's kind of a cheesy analogy, but I, I think it bolsters my students up and it's something they're familiar with. I can say, you know, it's like martial arts and, you know, there's, there's these ranks and these levels that you move through. And in the beginning, there's lots of rapid gains, but Mm -hmm. um, then, then you look at these great masters that have been studying the the art form their whole life and they, they don't gain levels and ranks until it it, was throughout for, for long periods of time, they go, you know, 10 years before they might see uh, an increase in their rank, but they're always Mm -hmm. still moving forward on a path. So they're always students really. Yeah. 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 That's, um, yeah, that's, 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 yeah, that's exactly how I, how I felt. I remember writing my, you know, um, my essay to get into undergrad, just like knowing that I was submitting to forever being a student. Um, And yeah, I, I, um, I guess, yeah, that leads me to something else that we wanted to talk about tonight was um, uh, like, you know, um, I, I, I had this I had this kind of obsession with um, working from life. So uh, like I, I, I was very uh, unlike, you Noah, and, and that I uh, I um, I could really only draw what was in front of me for you know, the longest time it's, you know, relatively recently that I've kind of figured out how to work for my imagination and, uh, um, Wait, two or three dimensions, uh, um, two dimensions. Okay. So, um, I, I mean, well, I, I didn't really start making sculpture until later, but, uh, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, I um, uh, I want to, I want to, you know, bring up the idea of, um, of, you know, working from life, like how, how important is that to, um, to each of you? Um, we'll start with Gabriella, maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what I didn't really, really experience, uh, drawing from life until I got to the Academy. Um, I don't know how many people know, but I'm from Panama and, uh, we're, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, I th- there wasn't re- a ton of access to nude models. Uh, I remember uh, in the time that I was in, in the in the undergrad, uh, I had we had we didn't. I mean, I had a nude model maybe I don't know twice or something uh, mm-hmm. for just one class, and then the other times the the models were wearing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did not get to experience um, uh, working from life in that capa- in, you know in that way until I got to the academy, where it was just like every week more mm-hmm. than one day a week being able to work from life and I, and I, and it was such a treat um yeah. it is such a treat it is such a privilege to be able to see the body in that way because you know we we there's there's like this disconnect uh there's a disconnect between ourselves and the between you know us and the human body 
and our own bodies, you know, we're, I don't know if you, I, I mean, I just, I feel like we're kind of in denial of the human body. And just for me being able to see it that way, it was just, and to be able to learn from it and draw it and study it and just, be, I don't know, be allowed to kind of like stare at a person and then be able to stare at my drawing to study what's happening on the body in that way. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it's really, uh, it's a wonderful tool uh, to be able to learn drawing even more. Um, you know, since since the since having graduated, I don't have a, the same amount of access to a, a, a live model. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I've always been able to work just fine from photographs and from my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I, um, I mean, everybody, I guess, knows Wade. But uh, he uh, he told me once, uh, Wade Schumann from the Academy. He told me once, uh, or he mentioned it in, in the class. I don't know uh, how it's. They're all different muscles. And we should all, we should practice working all of the muscles, working from photographs, from mm -hmm. life and from your head. I mean, they, because uh, uh, they all inform each other and they all strengthen each other. And they're all tools that you use in order to be, that we use in order to be able to make the work. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like that. I, I, uh, I talk yeah. about, um, I, I, uh, I use that um, analogy um, 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 quite often when I'm, you know, just, and talking about you know figurative sculpture it's a, like you know people get really stuck in 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 these um uh in in these um uh in these very specific ideas and ways of working and they they're they're mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're they're all tools and i think you're absolutely yeah. right i think mm -hmm. Wade is right yeah that you need to practice all of them and they can all help inform each yeah, other and sure. you use them in different places and in different ways Mm -hmm. So I, I that, that, that's um, yeah I I I know that you work um, you work that way too Lauren you, uh, we we um, we host an open life drawing session uh, here once a week um, at our studio and so yeah we're we're you know we're drawing from life you know once a week typically and but 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 you end up you know using a lot of photo references because you know lately you've been drawing astronauts and that's. Uh, you know, we are in Florida. We're not too far from Cape. Can well, I mean, you know, it's a bit of a drive um, from um, from um, Cape Canaveral, but uh, um, it's yeah, it's uh, hard to get access to uh, to draw those sorts of models. So, um, how do you feel about about that? You know, working from life. It's. I think that's. You know, it's it's hard because I think it's the most optimal way to work, but I think in a, in a lot of ways it can be the most unattainable. And, and when I, I went to undergrad at Northwestern University in Chicago, and it's an amazing school, but their art department was going through a really transformational time, and it was going heavily, heavily conceptual. So there really was hardly any opportunity to work from life. So I had to schlep my, my portfolio down to like an atelier in downtown Chicago in the weekends and, and try to get time in with a model there. But I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like purely looking. Um, so Gabriella, just like you, by the time I got to the Academy, I was like, oh my God, there's, there's models everywhere. You know, like what, what do I do? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, um, oh, man, it was, it was kind of amazing. And what was kind of, crazy and harvey citron said this very prophetic he said you know everything you're you're kind of looking at and doing will kind of coagulate like five years after you've graduated yeah. and i noticed you know five years later when you know i wasn't really able to work from a model and was looking at a, a lot of photo references, I was trying to recall from memory the things that I'd been observing from a model. And, um, and then when we opened our studio in Florida, it was, it was really important that we get some sort of open life drawing thing going. And, you know, our goal with that is just to make enough to pay for the model. And again, I think people, some people kind of laugh that Brett and I are so insistent that we participate also. Again, they think if you really know everything, you don't need to do this, whereas it's quite the opposite. And so as my own studio practice continues and I've really pivoted into very different subject content from which I can pretty much only work from photographs, I, I realize that, you know, um, having the experience of knowing 
what structures and forms look like as observed by the naked eye versus as regurgitated through a camera lens makes it so that when I have mm, to look at, yeah. a, as a, at a reference from a camera lens, you know, you can see what it's distorting. You can see where it as a middleman doesn't function with the same acuity as a human being. And yeah. um, it makes it so that, and again, I've been trying to work more from imagination. So use the photo reference for maybe the first 15 to 20% of a drawing and then do the rest from imagination. And then maybe look back at the photo to double check things, um, especially as the imagery I'm doing right now is super, super, super technical. But again, it's huge because I'm drawing astronauts or, and what are they? They're wrapped in big puffy suits. What's going on underneath? So it helps to know like, that happening below everything and at least knowing like this I can liken to a cylinder underneath this is a, a you know an ovoid shape underneath and I've drawn tons of those so I know just exactly how the light hits it so even if it's ambiguous or the edges are way too sharp in this photo like I know how to kind of go back in and revert it back to what I hope is a more pure image um you know, again, Harvey said exactitude is not truth. And I think he's quoting Matisse. Mm. And, I, and I, I think working from life helps you approach truth, even if you're not, you know, even if you're using different kind of references later on. So yeah. that's my long one. Yeah, no. Um, uh, uh, so, um, Noah, uh, like Lauren, you also have a skeleton uh, standing over your shoulder. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I, I, I think, I don't know, maybe it was a few months ago or, uh, I don't know, maybe longer than that, but, um, you had a, um, you had a study of a hand that I saw you post on Instagram and I left a comment about, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think I was probably saying how great it was or something. And you, uh, and, and you mentioned that that was the hand that you had, um, um, drawn completely from your imagination. Uh, it, but, but, but I assume that you work from life a lot, uh, also, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 you know, it's really exciting to see, you know, that's sort of a, um, invention come out. So, I, yeah, I was excited to see that hand come out too. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you never know, it's, is it going to work out or, you know, um, or sometimes it doesn't. But um, this, you know, this is a huge topic in, in our community of mm -hmm. figurative representational realists and figurative narrative work. And there, there are so many camps involved yeah. in, and that weigh in. Um, and, and some of them are quite dogmatic. Well, there's one in particular that's dogmatic. And those are the people that believe in working from life only. Everyone else yeah. is kind of like, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And then yeah. there's the people who work from life only. Um, and so I love, I love what, um, Gabriella shared about what Wade said. And I love, mm -hmm. I love Wade Schumann. And, um, I think that's a beautiful idea to way to put it. Um, unfortunately I never got to study with Wade, even though he was always there when I was a student at the New York Academy, but then we became colleagues when I was teaching there and I got to interact with Wade more on that level. And, um, but I really appreciate that idea that these are all muscles. The, 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 these, there's three areas. There's working from life, there's working from photographic reference, and then there's mm -hmm. invention mm -hmm. from a mental source and from memory. And um, they're all equally valid, I feel. I, I just want to go on record as saying that. And, mm -hmm. and they each inform each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, let's put working from life up here with a halo on it, and then the other yeah. two could be down <laughs> here. Let's yeah. just make it a triangle, or they eat, it's a rotating triangle. And, um, but I feel like I can say that confidently and with authority because I now confess that I was on the dogmatic side of you have to work from life only <laughs> or you're not really doing it. Well, and yeah. I was that way for many years. And um, and I've trained for many years working exclusively exclusively from life. And at yeah. Pennsylvania Academy, we were just drowned in working from life on a seven days a week, 24 mm -hmm. hours a day basis. Mm -hmm. And then again at the New York Academy, uh, we work from life all the time as you guys have. And um, and then continuing as as a professor of figure drawing and portraiture and anatomy 
Um, I'm, you know, I'm constantly, I, I just sit down right with the students and I'm demonstrating. So I'm always mm -hmm. working from life on a mm -hmm. continual basis. And um, I call, I get the model to come pose for me in the studio and, um, and just draw from life on a mm -hmm. regular basis. But let me say something that's a little, a little, little bit um, maybe um, controversial. Um, Please. Drawing poses from life are boring. Yes. <laughs> and um, I don't know, but you, can, you, can, you can have the model stand there for 18 sessions in a row, three hours a piece, and do a mm -hmm. beautiful standing figure. And I'll go, wow, that is gorgeous. I love it. I yeah. want to do it. When it comes time to paint a narrative figure painting, I don't want the model sitting there looking pensively off into space. Um, and I also don't want a model sitting there looking pensively in the, in the, into space where then I have to concoct a background and a narrative that's retroactively inserted. Right. And that's mostly yeah. person coming from the affiliate community. I see a beautiful model posing there. And mm -hmm. then some, con some background's been added and some things been added into their hand to now concoct a narrative. No, I, I want the model to come into the studio. I tell them what the narrative is. I've already mm -hmm. planned it out from the convention. I need the pose to be like this. I show them. Uh, I try lots of variations on it. I photograph the hell out of the pose. Mm -hmm. I take lots of photographs. I take video footage. I move the video camera like this. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah. And so I can see all sides of the pose. Um, and I, I'll work from photograph for a lot of my major works. And, uh, I've, I've come to learn that um, I learned a lot from working from photo, uh, excuse me, from life. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a majority of my youth drawing from invention out of my head. Um, and then I suddenly realized that I also was learning a lot from working from photograph. Mm -hmm. And that the photograph taught me how to see shape better. And mm. the photograph taught me how to use compressed value ranges, which, you know, leads to higher mm. levels of realism. Um, Interesting. how to simplify, how to organize shadow shapes versus yeah. light shapes. Yeah. Um, and of course, gave me access to more dynamic poses. And also as an anatomist, both a practitioner and a professor, uh, simply put, you know, the photograph gives you access to more action oriented poses where you can engage muscles that are not, that are not possible to engage mm -hmm. uh, in poses from life. You can simulate it, you can prop the model's arm up like that, but none of those muscles are active. Yeah. Um, but if you have the model take the pose for a few a few seconds in your in your in your studio straining or trying to balance or twisting, you you engage this rich uh, interactive uh, relationships of muscles up and down the figure that become yeah. uh, really exciting to have in in, in the paint. Yeah. So um, I also think about because I mean of course you know we all have guilt a little bit about it. it's a residual guilt about working with photograph there's a voice saying you should be working from life but I think well wait a minute how many of my heroes openly work from photograph you know yeah. starting with John Leon Jerome I mean he mm -hmm. he, he worked from photograph he didn't try to hide it we know factually he worked from photograph because we mm -hmm. have photographs that match exactly the painting uh uh um uh uh Cezanne uh, excuse me I'm sorry um Manet as I wanted to say Manet um, did a lot of his masterworks from photograph. Um, mm -hmm. Olympia and Dejeuner Soul Arab are absolutely factually done from photograph because the lighting is the exact kind of lighting you see from a photographer's flash mm -hmm. in the Parisian uh, commercial studios of 1864 when they all opened up. All the photography right. studios mm -hmm. in Paris opened up in the year 1864. They hung their sign out and they started taking clients. 40% of their clients were artists and painters that's fascinating um, yeah and so so a lot of uh, uh manet's works are are from photographs and um you know amazing paintings like um uh joan of arc by uh by um um Jules Bastien. Lepage, <sighs> uh, posing in the met that's a photograph yeah um so um i think about my heroes present day heroes like uh, bo bartlett and vincent desiderio no apologies for using photographic mm -hmm. reference Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important to be immersed in all these different modes of working. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, as an anatomy person, a lot of what I do does end up coming from invention because I'm looking at a photograph and I'm thinking, oh, there's no information there. I'm just going to insert what I know. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times, uh, and uh, we all have a lot of experience in anatomy here. I know just because we've all gone to the New York Academy. 
um, and, but it, it's, it's going to find its way to informing your work. So we translate the photo. I think we've all yeah, said that yeah, in different yeah. here. We see the photo, we know what it should look like from life. We know what it should look like conceptually because we've studied anatomy um, and it takes place on the canvas or on the panel or on the paper um, and it becomes art. So that's that's what I have to say about all of this um, <laughs> debate about working from life versus from photo. You know, is that yeah. there's there's a lot more than just saying it that simply. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. given what's behind you, um, you're definitely not a hypocrite. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, 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 Gabriella, I, I, I um. Um, I see your work uh, kind of, um, you know, verging on this, um, uh, on these mannerist ideas. And, and those are the people that have, um, that have been fascinating me recently. Um, I, w once I, once I figured out that, you know, so many of the old masters were actually working from their imagination, you know, they didn't have models, you know, sitting in these, you know, um, 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 contorted positions right yeah yeah they weren't like you know torturing their models and uh th th that's you know that they knew enough of the structural anatomy to be able to start to uh, you know make things up and um manipulate things i i once once i started to you know reach that understanding of um anatomy where i was able to you know work from my imagination um you know, in that same sort of way, I, I became fascinated with the ideas of, you know, how you might, you know, stylize and uh, like, you know, sort of warp and, you know, twist things to suit your own ideas, you know, the thing that you want to say. And so I, 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 um, I see you doing that a lot with, um, um, for example, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, the Supermodel 2 uh, image that that you provided us with here. So, <laughs> um, so what 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 do you, what do you, what do you what, what do you where where, um, where did that come from? So like, um, how are you approaching that that uh, image, and how how are you um, 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 how was it that you were able to um, construct that? Okay, so. Um, um, you know, each, each, everybody has like, kind of like their own mis like mistaken or whatever it is, tendencies when we're making drawings, like whether, e even if it is from life, I think uh, everybody has like, some people make huge hands and then they have mm. to correct them. And so like, mm -hmm. it's like a constant or it's, it's something that happens all the time when they're drawing. And so I tend to make long necks mm -hmm. uh, when I'm drawing in, uh, and um, so in, in that kind of drawing, like in supermodel too, um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, in a way it's like an ongoing series sort of, because it's just, it's just, it's going to happen again. It's just a matter of time, uh, that I'm going to make a drawing like that. Uh, and so I just like indulge in, uh, I wish I could say I'm doing a specific thing to the shoulder girdle, but I don't know what it is. Um, just kind of, um, I don't know, loving it, I guess, to say it in a really corny way. Mm. Uh, I just think the shoulder girdle is, the neck and shoulder girdle are just uh, this very interesting, beautiful, delicate, elegant part of the body. And it has like all of this musculature. Uh, I mean, obviously it does, you know, like the, uh, the musculature of the shoulder is like this whole weird thing where the only part where it's touching the skeleton is the clavicle for whatever oh, reason yeah. i don't know mm -hmm. uh and just like all of this stuff i mean you know it might be something about uh, society itself just really loving a beautiful neckline or something maybe i don't mm -hmm. know uh might be because my neck isn't super long and i dream of a longer <laughs> neck uh, whatever it is it's like i just really want to kind of like uh, like adore this area and kind mm -hmm. of convey that adoration by just me just uh studying it at the same time as making it beautiful and then idealizing it like indulging in that uh, default ideal idealization and so with supermodel 2 specifically whenever there's a model that just happened to ha happens to have a long ass neck like uh, <laughs> linda evangelista because uh, she has she already has a long that neck and sense. i just made just gave her a monster neck in the, in the drawing <laughs> um and so I, I mean and and so to to kind of like uh talk a little bit about what Noah was talking about a second ago, just mm -hmm. with what we already know about anatomy a little bit. And so 
how having had having looked at the figure in life or or whatever so like i am mm -hmm. trying to um kind of work from the photograph because that one is actually from a photograph mm -hmm. uh, the photograph is a, a picture of linda evangelista and the photographer was um some ranked guy like i think it was mario sorrenti i don't know one of mm -hmm. these fashion photographer type guys um and so, you know, she has like her model body and I was like, I want her to have more muscle. I want her to be more muscly because I, who doesn't love some muscle, right? So um, I just, you know, I wanted, I wanted to populate her, her body with just more of what was kind of like, what, what was like already there. And what I know is there, you know, like sternocleidomastoid and deltoid, like being twisted. Cause she's like the position she has, she's like turning her arms inward. Mm -hmm. um and so mm -hmm. and so i wanted to give her like more muscle and so you know i mean i I'm, i want to just talk about the the muscle and the skin and because um <clears throat> there's much more stuff underneath there you know there's veins and mm -hmm. there's fat and there's there's like the the fiber of the muscle itself and just like her gesture stretching her skin and like the the heads of sternocleidomastoid going into the into sternum like the time i don't know there's like all of this stuff that's just really um beautiful and fluid like like a river mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. all of this Can beautiful stuff that. happening in there and um i don't want to i don't want to like get super abstract or i don't want to sound, sound like a cult leader or something talking about the neck <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's just i just want to you know talk about that musculature and like convey the musculature the surface of the skin on the on mm -hmm. the body there with all the muscles underneath <laughs> no that makes no. sense and it also picks up too like you know noah you were talking about artists who were unabashed about using photos and and gabriella what you're talking about is the same thing that parmigianino in the 16th century did you know and i think again that kind of goes to show you know, there is a certain dogma associated with figure drawing and, and again, you know, working from life and drawing exactly what's in front of you in the most literal way. But God knows throughout art history, if certain artists had had access to the technology we had now, would they even be artists? You know, I mean, can you imagine like the sort of photoshopping you know, artists from the past would have done? So like, Gabriel, I see your work and I think of Parmigianino. You know, but on the other hand, you use these very 21st century, you know, iconographic images, at least within our cultural lexicon to achieve the same thing. So I think it really shows how figure drawing can bridge, you know, past, present. It, it really shows how timeless it is in a way. So I love Parmigianino, by the way. That's my well, personal no, but bias. Th th that's, uh, that's something that I think, uh, like, you know, is... Um, um, I think all three of you are are, yeah, are really gifted in that where you yeah you have all those different um, you know tools so to speak you know you you've 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 um, yeah you've 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 done enough drawing from life and you know done enough you know drawing from your imagination that yeah that you're able to you know solve those sorts of problems and to you know create you know your own um, you know unique images and you know you're able to you know you know build images that suit what it is that you want to communicate so like um 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 lauren i've been watching you uh like um you know you know choose which parts of the you know astronaut suits that you want to edit out in order to make mm. a stronger image and mm. uh that, that's you know that you know even though you're you know working from photographs for those it's you know it's it's about editing things. It's about you know creating a strong image, and I think that you've done um, you know, a really good job. You know, pulling out the things that interest you and kind of uh, you know highlighting those and you know using those to you know communicate this uh, you know you know very you know uh, you know technical idea about you know drawing through a really uh, you know old medium, silver point. Um, you know, you've been able to, you know, take this very old medium and, you know, use it to talk about a very, you know, contemporary idea, you know, space flight and like, you know, where we're going as human beings. And Well, it all goes back to drawing <laughs> eggs when I was in your class, Noah. I mean, to be honest and, and full disclosure, like I was one of Noah's students in 2010 and that, that was a transformational class for me. And um, my God, you know, like... <sighs> 
I, I can't tell you how, how, how pivotal. That was a turning point. You know, I'd kind of been stumbling around blind drawing from the figure in life before then. And then I took that class and I was like, okay, this is what's, this is what's bubbling underneath the surface. Like it's like the princess and the pea. And I'm like, oh, that's the pea, you know? Um, so the, the fun thing about drawing the astronaut drawings is it's all more geometric structural drawing all of it you know all the little bells and whistles and gadgets on their on their suits everything it's all ellipticals it's all planes it's all um god it makes me wish i would have taken perspective with patrick connors <laughs> at the academy you know um but it really it's it's funny because it's so the the drawings are are they're actually and i'll say this because it's my work they're incredibly misleading in terms of where you think the technical focus would be because it, everything is about this surface detail again like these these tiny literal nuts and bolts but you can't do a goddamn bit of that if you don't know what the hell is going on underneath it if you don't know the skeleton and how those things move in space like noah you were talking about taking video of your models to see things from different angles like if, if you don't know how form and structure operates, again, if you don't see that tiny P under all the mattresses, there's no, people are gonna tune in at this point and think like we're talking about bedwetting problems or something. <laughs> but you know, the, the bottom line is you, you really have to know, um, you know what's causing all those effects rippling on up. And to me, that's a, a technical challenge, which I don't always pull off in those drawings, but that I, I do enjoy because it forces me to apply those same very innermost core principles about what's going on again there to everything, even what you think is on on the surface. Um, again, it's just it's a lot of ellipticals. Oh my God, it's a lot of ellipticals. Um, but that's kind of my my that's kind of my rant about. And I I I, I haven't really done stuff like that. One of the images that Brett had up was. Um, an etching. I did a little series of etchings recently, and that was like awesome because it's you just have the line, you know. You're just really forced to to consider everything, and it's kind of funny how I made those just as kind of like a fun Sunday project, really. And it ended up being a really good technical refresher, reminding me of the topography that everything has and how it kind of spirals out from the innermost um, character of what you're doing up to the outer outer surface. And again, um, you know, going back to that notion of play, you know, we all drew as, as kids what excited us. And, and so incorporating a little bit of color, um, a little bit of graphic quality, even if imperfect, you know, um, into the work and kind of being more experimental and seeing what happens despite how, how close and tight everything looks. But um, yeah, honestly, like eggs, envision everything as an egg and it all falls into place on top of it and people laugh but we've got plastic eggs here in our studio and we'll put them in front of what? people yeah yeah you yeah. can order a, a bag That's of cool. toy plastic like it's like for kids to have in like a farm play setup but um yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah we bust them out a lot it's it's you know it's rib cage it's it's the thigh it's the the mass of the head you know and the skull it's 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 everything it's everything yeah, yeah. So. so um 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 noah um lauren um alluded to the idea that she got a lot of these uh ideas um from you so wh 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 where where um, um where did you get all these uh ideas that uh um uh, th that um, Lauren is so um, lucky to, to to have been um, gifted with. So I I, I um I I I'd, I'd like to hear like um, uh, who your you know biggest um, um, influence was and how you kind of arrived at this idea of you know you know structural anatomy and you know drawing eggs. Well, it came from Martha Erlbacher, and um, she was. Uh, she was um got a call coming in here sorry oh it's okay, uh, sorry. It's all right. okay. um hopefully that didn't come over my um so <laughs> as she was a mentor of mine at the new york academy uh when i was there from 2000 to 2002 and martha earl uh passed away in 2013 um but she was a huge uh force and presence at the academy um 
uh, up until she retired in about, uh, well, I, I sort of filled in for taking, I took over her class at the New York Academy. So I think she kind of retired around 2007 or 2008. And then I started teaching her class, which was anatomical drawing in 2009 and 10. But um, Martha was, was uh, of the mind that the artist really needed to know the form and the structure. Um, and so she was uh, very, I would say very Florentine in her sensibilities mm. in that, you know, it was about concept first. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. about um, your perception of the model. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about knowing the structure and the volume and uh, concepts of how light behaves or should behave. And then the model is sort of second to that. And mm -hmm. so, and then, then of course she brought in the idea of understanding anatomy really intimately and letting that be the filter through which you see everything. Mm -hmm. So you know, she was always explaining, um, you know, the mechanics of joints. You know, she would she would talk about a, a knee a knee joint versus um, you know the humeroglenoid joint, where you know she talked about a ball and socket. And she would draw the mechanics of that on on the board, and she was always trying to get us to think about those concepts. Um, so I, I always think Florentines are, uh, you know, Florentine Renaissance artists were really concept driven. You know, they they had the models, mm -hmm. but they were really trying to convey a concept that they were holding up in their mind about about form and structure, about anatomy, about life behavior. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's versus what the Venetians did, which really were more about, um, let's think mostly about light and space. Mm -hmm. And let's yeah. do more looking and observing at the model. And then, of course, when Caravaggio came on, came along in, in, into Rome, um, you know, he made it really like, let's just work from light. And um, but Martha was very much about um, concept as being uh, ascendant. And mm -hmm. so I taught, I tried to teach at the New York Academy in her tradition. And um, she was a real drill sergeant. And I, you know, that's not my personality. But, but one thing that she did that Lauren mentioned was she made us draw eggs over and over again. And she would always, we, you know, we'd come in, we'd present them on the wall. And, and usually it was one to three eggs and little, um, little still lives uh, illuminated by a single light source. And they were just never good enough for her. You know, she, she would assign them. We would come and present them on the wall and she would walk up and down, just kind of shaking her head, not saying anything. <laughs> and then she'd be like, none of you got it. You know, you didn't get it. And um, she'd say, all right, everybody do them again. You know, of course she would make comments as to why we didn't yeah. get it. And, you know, we would argue with her. We'd say, but that's what I saw. And she'd say, it doesn't matter what it looks like. You know, it matters mm -hmm. what you're communicating on the drawing. And, um, and we had, to, I, I still have a stack of eggs that are, it's just amazing how many she made us draw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and she made, and if they weren't done meticulously, she would criticize them. If the shape wasn't right, she would criticize them. If, if the light and shadow or the form turning wasn't correct, you know, we had to do them again. And uh, that's always stayed with me, that, that kind of um, thought about, about uh, an artist's awareness of, of form. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this idea comes out of this, this that, that Martha talked about a lot. And, and I know Harvey, if he were here uh, mm -hmm. with us today, um, would talk a lot about the issue of form sense. And, and every artist has to develop their own form sense. I mean, Parmigianino mm -hmm. did it, and, and clearly Gabriella is doing that too. Mm -hmm. um you know when she takes liberties with the with the structure of the neck and so an artist has a form sense it's it's their own vision of what the figure uh translates to in their mm -hmm. work and i think form sense comes down to a couple of just really we can boil it down to some really key factors and that is uh height to width relationship you know so if i show you a rectangle and ask you to draw it you might draw it like this or somebody else might draw it like that and the other thing is peak deviation so if there's mm -hmm. a curve and there's a peak on that curve, you know, I might see the peak over here and then you might see the peak over here. Mm -hmm. If we put those two things mm -hmm. together, um, we really have the, the makeup of each artist's specific form sense. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't heard it broken down that way. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I think that's what, that's what uh, Martha really str uh, stressed mm -hmm. a lot was yeah. developing your form sense. You know, it's it's like it's also like just an artist style is their form yeah. sense. I mean, when we look at a Lucian Freud painting, we know we're looking at Lucian Freud. We don't have to be told. 
Yeah. Uh, when we look at Raphael, we know we're looking at Raphael because each of these artists have their form sense and they create their world right. uh, based on their form sense. You know, if I look at Bo Barlett or Vincent Desiderio, I can read their form sense. If I look at Michelangelo um, versus uh, Manet, you know, I can mm -hmm. read their form sense. I know it's, their, it's the thumbprint of their work. And mm -hmm. uh, you've got to develop that form sense. And that, uh, that comes through um, so many things. It comes through all the muscles that Wade talked about. It comes through invention. It comes through studying from life. But it also comes um, uh, from, a little bit from ph photographic uh, observation mm -hmm. as well. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I I um uh, I like that you uh, um, uh, mentioned Harvey um, Harvey Citron in there because he um, I know that he and Martha Erbacher were close and uh, I, it was it was actually something that Harvey said in um, uh, in one of um, one of the one of the drawing classes that I was taking with him that was kind of one of the biggest turning points for me where he he we we uh, we were drawing a model and uh he he was um he was giving someone a hard time about you know including some reflected light on the back side of the model and uh and you know and the person said uh, oh well that like th there you know there really isn't any reflected light there that's not what i see and he's like well it doesn't matter what you see and and and, and so he went into this whole um uh, kind of um, 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 lesson where he like you know pulled out a big sheet of foam core and you know created some reflected light on the back side of the model and that was that was uh, that was the moment when I started to to um, uh, to understand that 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 I didn't have to be limited by you know what I saw in front of me and that there really yeah that it really does come back to you know, utilizing all these different tools, like, you know, using your imagination, like, you know, knowing those structural ideas and mm -hmm. uh, like, um, you know, and then, you know, if you have those tools, then, then yeah, you can, you know, you can use a photograph. It's, it's you know, it's about knowing how to, you know, balance all of those things in, in an intelligent way. So, yeah. um, uh, I just want to uh, say that we are at eight o'clock right now, so uh, we have uh, we have hit our um, our limit, and uh, we have a couple comments uh, coming up on uh, on the YouTube chat, and uh, I want to apologize if there are people out there that aren't seeing the chat bar. Uh, try um, try closing this window and opening it again. Uh, we had a setting in the wrong place uh, with YouTube and our chat bar was not activated at the very beginning of this live stream. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're not seeing the chat bar and you want to ask a question, uh, we do want to, um, we do want to hear from you all. Um, uh, we have a few comments coming in. Um, let's see. Um, Pim Power says, fascinating to hear. I'm teaching drawing foundations at NJCU right now, and this is really relevant. So, um, um, Kim, we are um, really excited to hear that. Um, we, we, we're, we're just, you know, we're thrilled that, uh, um, uh, that Noah and Gabriella took the time to hang out with us tonight because this is, yeah, this is the sort of stuff that we just want to talk about all the time. And uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's really fantastic through zoom that we can we can do this um we're hearing from daryl smith a former guest of ours on another oh, panel lovely. discussion um i love love that talk of form sense uh and uh uh yeah daryl thank you uh we, we we're yeah i mean yeah form sense is something near and dear to my heart so um, yeah, I, I, I just, uh, I can't get over what you said, Noah, that, that idea of, you know, taking that rectangle and, you know, the width, um, you know, how we might perceive that and then like, you know, where we might see that apex of the curve. That's, um, yeah, that's something that really blows my, blows my mind. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I, mean, I think we have to distill it down to find out, you know, what, what is the essence of form sense? Because people want to know how do I have, you know, how can I have that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say that, you know, that's where I think the danger of too much photographic conditioning comes in. Yeah. Is that if you are hyperly lens based in your practice of art, then your form sense becomes the lens. Right. Mm. And, it, and, and you, 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 um, 
you preclude the possibility of developing your own form sense because you're you're going to precisely lock in height to width relationships and you're going to lock in precise uh locations of peak peaks on a curve and there's um there's no room for that style that self style to start to creep into your work mm. so you know you see this when artists m maybe some artists that project photographs and trace them off or artists that um, grid photographs and then uh, you know they'll they'll make a grid on the photograph and they'll make a grid on the canvas and depending on how small and how tight that grid is I've seen artists that do big fat grids just to kind of quickly get things in, in a rough place and then I've seen artists do tiny little grids and when you do a tiny little grid like that um, I think it takes away your form sense because yeah. you're just now really copying what the lens is telling you to do right. And the form sense is so beautiful. It's it's our it's our thumbprint of yeah. Our, yeah. our voice. Yeah. You know, that's why you can look at I can put up three drawings, Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo. Anybody listening to this conversation would be able to pick them out with no trouble. Mm -hmm. They might not be able to say why, but they just they know it. And right. it's mm -hmm. it's the form sense issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think most people who know me know that I hate projecting photographs <laughs> yeah you don't want to bring up uh, the idea of you know, projecting reason. around lauren thanks gabriella <laughs> thank you yeah. thank I you i have opinions about i have opinions about that stuff for sure um mm -hmm. yeah the the um the 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 person's own language they speak with when they're making work like it takes practice for that to come out it's just like when you're learning i mean mm -hmm. you know when we're learning to write for example you have to mm -hmm. do this calligraphy thing first yeah. and then your handwriting develops at some point and it's your handwriting so it's like not just do we have to work all of the muscles like a draw from as many different kinds of sources as possible but you also have to practice drawing just drawing in general for uh mm -hmm. for a style to develop for like your visual style to develop mm -hmm. and then you know like uh noah was saying just now i mean you'll be somebody able to pick your shit out just without oh that's that guy i know mm -hmm. that visual language like from here to a mile away yeah i love the thumbprint and handwriting sure. analogies yeah. i love that yeah, yeah. i'm i'm very daryl says yes gabriella <laughs> i'm i try not to be militant about a lot of things but i'm very militant about projecting, not projecting. <laughs> but I, I need a whole bottle of this. If I, mm, mm, it's not, 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 mm, no. Mm, mm. And it's very disappointing when I admire someone. I'm like, hey, that looks cool. And then I'm like, oh, you can tell they, ah, mm, uh. yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I definitely try. I mean, I try to keep stuff to myself. I mean, I'm not trying to deliberately be a, like a grumpy jerk or something, you know, but, but, uh, you know, I have, I, I, I don't care for tracing. Like if, uh, you know, I, I don't know, like that's too much, that's too much like tracing to me. And it's like, mm -hmm. I want to see your artist hand struggling to make that thing is like, tell yeah. me the thing with your hand. I'd rather like, see don't it have flawed. A... Huh? I'd rather see it flawed. If it's true. Yeah, it, but but it, but but it's like but it's like you know so, somebody I think Noah a little while ago said something about how you know like a student saying something like oh but that's what it looks like and it's like no it's like you're responsible for that image you know mm -hmm. if if it looks flawed to you then fix it mm -hmm. it's like don't it's like so like it's different let's so, like for me like the point in which it kind of like pivots or, or something it's like if the projection is a tool okay. But if you depend on it to make work, yeah, that and it's a crutch, like that is a problem for me. Like that's when it's a problem for me. Yeah. You know, so it's like if you just want to get the if you just want to get like the sketchy part out of the way or something, but you're perfectly capable of making the sketch part and just making the thing from scratch yourself, fine. You want to save time, fine. You have a deadline, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's like if it's a crutch, I have I personally have a problem with that. Okay. It's like because it's like it's similar actually to what we said earlier about drawing from life. It's like if you refuse to make work unless it's drawn from life, I can I personally consider that a, a crutch in a way because it's like all right now you can't make work because you can't afford a model. It's like that sounds like an excuse to me. Yeah, it's that's like, good. Draw, draw some. Yeah, yeah. it's like, it's like mm -hmm. draw something else, draw from your head, draw from a picture. Like you can't depend on a single source of. Oh. Like you, you know, oh we God. can't. We have enough limitations. Yeah. You can't have another yeah. limitation. 
I yeah. No, I I agree. And and I will I will clarify and say like if someone makes a drawing and they have to transfer it or enlarge it, if it's their original drawing that they've done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Cuz I've transferred my own drawings. I actually I think I transferred the one behind us, but I drew it to scale on graphite freehand. And then I did the little, you know, Raphael prick around the surface and and dotted in. But when someone um creates an when someone presents a work like they are they are the sole responsible driving force for that image when in fact it's just a projected photograph then it's like yeah nope that you shouldn't have bothered doing it in the first place sorry yeah. i'm again i try not i try to not be too militant <laughs> about things but that is one thing that is that is uh, <sighs> No. We well, have a couple other comments. Oh, right. I, I am a bad producer here. I got a little distracted. So let's see if we have any questions. He's scared of me now because he knows. <laughs> yeah, now that we've brought up that topic, I am, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm worried. Um, all right. So uh, thank you from Sienna Wood. And let's see. Uh, so Alonzo Soriano says, so... If form sense should be our unique natural inclination of peaks and height versus width uh, instead of based on, say, an idealized lens, then isn't that the opposite of basing your anatomy on what you know instead of what you actually see right in front of you? Um, um, Alonzo continues, uh, just curious why one should be ideal and one should be unique. Uh, instead of reversed, or both one way or another. So I, 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 I um. Alonzo, you're splitting things into categories that might not. Um, maybe, maybe the, the, the unique and the ideal are the same, and and maybe um, the natural inclination of peaks and height versus width is the idealized lens. That's how I would answer that. Yeah. Sorry, just just because I'm right next to the broadcasting <laughs> software and can see the comment right there. I'll let you guys go. I'm sorry about that. Well, you know, yeah, I, the Lonzo is a, an old friend and, and yeah. very intellectual one. I appreciate the question. And uh, he's always digging and trying to get at the truth um, for, you know, in a in a in a good way. And um, I I think that it's it's sort of a, an organic um, and uh, uh, um, just a natural uh, form sense is a natural outcome uh, partially from studying anatomy. And I think we've all had this experience of studying anatomy where you're, you're looking at how do the bones fit together um, and then how do the muscles join onto that. And you find yourself in the act of making these constructions either through diagrams or drawing from invention like an écorché drawings. Um, you find yourself then superimposing your own form sense into that. So so written into your understanding of anatomy is your form sense. So that's a really beautiful thing, I think. And you can see it in any uh, artist slash anatomist. You know, when we look at the anatomy studies by Leonardo, they are just completely written on his form sense. Mm. Same with Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. So you, so your form sense is going to be the lens, hopefully, through which everything passes. And mm -hmm. then... If I sit down and I say, let me try to draw the hell out of this model as accurately as I can. You know, I'm going to measure every damn thing. You can't do it with that. You can't escape your form sense because you think you're seeing uh, perceptual truth. But in fact, you're, you're un unknown to yourself. You're actually secretly biased. What, your vision is biased on your form sense. You're already preconditioned. You're already brainwashed. And you can't rinse it out of yourself. Yeah. You know, so you might sit there and say, I'm going to draw the ideal picture of perceptual truth, but it's going to be filtered through your form sense, whether you want it to or not. And because I, I try it all the time, yeah. I sit down and say, let me try to take my perceptual accuracy to a higher level today. No. And I'm going to hire the model for three to four sessions and I'm going to do a drawing um, for, from life. Uh, and I'm just going to, um, you know, measure and really try to get away from what I think, you know, my preconceived notions of structure and form are. I'm going to really surrender to my vision here and to what the model is showing me. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I look at that drawing a couple months later, and it still looks like one of my drawings. You know, why, why is <laughs> no? I, why doesn't it just look like a drawing, a good drawing? Yeah, it looks like one of my drawings. You know, and so, so why? Well, it's form sense. Yeah. So I think form sense it it stains everything we do and see in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's I think the answer to. Alonzo's question. It's a great yeah, question I, that he submitted. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, and I think you're right. Like we, I, I, I think that we have a built-in lens that we cannot, you know, escape from. And, you know, you may think, well, like, you know, if you're trying to be totally truthful, like, you know, to life, and you're trying to, you know, you know, escape your own sort of lens, you know, you might, you know, pick up a camera. But, you know, even then, like, you know, you have choices to make. Like, you know, do I want to use, you know, the 50 millimeter lens? Do I use the 200 millimeter lens? Like, mm-hmm. you know, and I I, I, um, um, I think it's kind of analogous to that, you know, that it, it's, um, we, you know, we can't escape that lens that that is kind of baked into our brain and, you know, intercepts the image in between our eyeballs and, you know, at the back of our skull. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gabrielle, yeah. what do you think to answer that question? Um, uh, well, for me, I guess it's kind of about my goal. What is the goal I have with the drawing that I'm working on, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of. Um, so if I want to be super realistic or something, then, I mean, that's going to kind of dictate the outcome, Mm -hmm. uh, the final result, the, I mean, how the drawing ends up, um, but no, I mean, I, I definitely agree with Noah in the sense that one's own form sense. I mean, what I'm understanding from that is that it, it's kind of like like your own, like your handwriting in the drawing, like your personal handwriting, like your personal visual language in the drawing is going to come through uh, no matter no matter what you're working on or what your source material is or, or what medium you're using, kind of like, it, because it's your language, it's your mm-hmm. voice. Um, but um, um, it it does depend it does it does kind of depend on what um in my case personally it depends on what i want to talk about like if i if i if i want to talk about if, if i really if i really like a top lit portrait and i want to do like talk about what is like in the shadows or like convey the eye socket that is like just covered in shadows in that case that, that's kind of gonna dictate what i do mm-hmm. uh, I, I guess for me it just depends on the goal mm-hmm what the goal is with, with each drawing. That's awesome, because that goes back, no, to what you were saying about Martha Erlbacher, that it was, it, you know, that very Florentine idea of, of concept, like you start with the idea first and then have everything else fall in around it. So that's a really nice circular relationship to that. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. And um, Alonzo has chimed in again for us, and he says, um, perhaps more than just built-in perceptual mental lens, maybe even physically, how your hand moves, how your eyes see. Oh, sure. El Greco, mm-hmm. um, yeah. he mentions that um, um, El, El, El Greco had a um, had a had a had a um, astigmatism. Uh, and Can you explain I, a lot. Yeah, I didn't know. Cool. <laughs> I didn't know that either. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I also have an astigmatism, and yeah, I wonder, I wonder what. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it, you know, Mary minor, Tom, but no, um, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, curious to think, like, you know, what, yeah, what type of, uh, you know, impact that might have on, you know, on my own practice, ha- like, uh, like, like, you know, had we not have, you know, technology to rely on for, mm-hmm. you know, certain fixes and stuff. And, I think and of, Alonso um, says, I'm guessing, but it yeah. makes sense. That's a good yeah. guess. Um, it's a good guess. I, I um. I, I remember seeing a big uh, uh, a big giant um, Monet show uh, at the MFA Boston when I was a kid, and um, um, seeing some paintings that he painted when he had um, had um, had um, um, had um, ca- ca- cat- cataracts and was you know nearly blind or you know he was yeah he was basically colorblind and he was asking for you know tubes of paint um, by name and. Uh, it's that's um yeah it's really interesting to think about what you know what sort of you know perceptual limitations we have and uh i i i um 
Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with that. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, I think we're just so lucky to be able to you know, live in a time where we have access to all these different things that can alter our perception. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's really fantastic. So um, um, Alonzo, thank you. Um, uh, and I also want to point out that um, Alonzo um, um, says that Noah was in his wedding. So that is a pretty fantastic claim to fame. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so um, let's see. Let me see if I had one more question here. Um, so uh, uh, is there anybody that, um, uh, each of you um, admire. That's something that I meant to I meant to, I meant to touch on, and uh, we, we like you know we talked a little bit about influences, but uh, um, is there somebody that you um, admire? You know, maybe somebody that that has a completely different approach to things uh, that that you know that you you know feel like might influence your work. So. Um, 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 Lauren, I know that you, uh, I mean, um, I know that you, you know, kind of like myself are often, uh, you know, attracted to work that's, you know, very much different than your own. Is there someone mm -hmm. that's making drawings that are completely different than your own that you really admire? Anthony Van Dykes. Yeah. Like a lot of people think he's just, oh, you know, like frilly little noodle fingered 17th century Rubens protege portraits. I kind of, you know, I, to a degree, yeah, but um, the Frick collection had an exhibition of his portraits a few years ago, and in the bottom, like, there's a basement level to the Frick, they had all his drawings. I assume down there, because there's no sunlight to, like, damage them, and I was amazed at how, like, without sounding cliche, how modern they looked, how sketchy, how unfinished, how unresolved. Like, you could see his hand just moving across the paper almost without lifting. And it was such a total 180 from what his paintings looked like, and yet so much more fascinating. Because I see Van Dyck as almost a, a darker predecessor to Rococo. And I kind mm. of hate Rococo. Like, I'm not as militant about Rococo as I am projecting photos. Um, but still, like, Watteau and Fragonard could, could draw like crazy. They were amazing draftsmen. And Van Dyke... And Boucher. And Boucher, yeah. And uh, Van Dyke drew not... You know, to me, drawing is an investigation, first and foremost. Drawing is an investigation. Um, there's nothing flippant about it. And whether or not you end up with, like, a pretty finished product is not... It, it's kind of negligible. And I realize this is incredibly hypocritical from someone who works in Silver Point, which is a very tight medium that requires a lot of premeditation. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm a bit of a hypocrite in some ways, but ultimately drawing is this really, really rigorous investigation. And I see, I, I to me, Van Dyke's drawings epitomize that. Like Gabriella, you're talking about goals. Like I can see his goals and his drawings um, laid beautifully bare. And um, to me, they actually look like, you know, tiny Michelangelo-esque scribbles. And, and that's another thing, you know, we, we have um, a couple catalogs of Michelangelo drawing shows and we show people certain sketches, not the more finished ones, but just like the, again, like the, just the movement of his hand on the paper. Again, going back to, to eggs, like it sounds very foundational, but these are concepts that the longer you're at this, the more you have to keep in the forefront of your mind. He's just, he's just going around and letting these lines coagulate into these ovoid, eggy forms. And um, Van, Van Dyke does something very similar. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, really, I really love his drawings. I love Bronzino. Oh, my God. God and Pontormo and Parmigianino. Um, Pontormo. Oh my God! Amazing! Yeah. Amazing! <laughs> Amazing! And, and 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 again, no one, no one. You know, it, it's just, and I feel like they they just aren't they aren't celebrated enough. So that's yeah. that's 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 me. That was very that's that's me. You shouldn't start with me first with questions because All then right. I'll just keep going. All right. So so um. Uh, yeah, who who who, uh, who are you uh, into, Gabriella? Is there somebody that did something you know kind of completely different? Um, 
Um, all right. I, I really like, so when an artist does paintings and drawings, I tend to favor their drawings because, you know, <laughs> drawing oh, yeah. for the win. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, um, um, I really like um, Sargent's drawings. Oh, man. Um, yeah. I know, oh, I know, right? And so um, th I mean, you know, it's that that is in his paintings as well because he had this quality to his work where he was just really efficient with mm -hmm. his mark making mm -hmm. in the sense that he used very few marks and he was able to convey all the information somehow through these summarized, this collective summarization of marks. He was somehow, somehow able to convey just the co complete information. And it's already in, it's it's also in his paintings, you know. He you can also see the marks in his in his in his paintings have that quality as well. But the but the drawings are just, you know. I mean, I I'm just it's just a bias, I guess. I can't I have no control over that. Uh, I just am I'm biased in favor of drawings. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, especially uh, I mean, for me, especially I mean, uh, Sergeant is a he's a boss. But Vantormo and Michelangelo, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. they both have. They both have this thing, and uh, we were we were talking about working from photographs earlier, and I think Wade also said something about how the those people like before photographs, mm -hmm. they would work their final paintings from a bunch of studies of drawings. Oh, that's um, like kind of what it looks like Noah's doing too a lot. Yeah, so like so like they had all of these studies done in drawing and stuff, and it's just um, I. I I would, I mean, I think Pontormo's in particular, he just has like this kind of like idealized, contorted, twisted quality to his bodies where like, mm -hmm. you know, it might, may or may not have been from life, it may have been from, from imagination, I don't remember what it is, but um, he just has like this quality where even if it's, if you saw, if that was a body in real life, it was, it would be like terrifyingly deformed. <laughs> Somehow in the drawing, it's like, it's just there's something to the rhythms and the relationships yeah. between things where and like the way that he populates uh the the mus the musculature and just like all of the folds and whatever it is um that it really it really i mean to me as a viewer it just gives me a really gratifying image and it's like i think some somebody else said also about uh michelangelo where it's just like i mean there's no there's he just like invented a bunch of muscles on there just to be able to populate yeah. a rhythm the image right. with a rhythm and it's like you know once once you're like familiar enough with the figure whether it is through anatomy or let drawing from life or whatever it is like you have like this you, you know and you practice of course like you're able to develop this shorthand mm. like a shorthand language to be able to populate the information with that familiar rhythm you know that rhythm that you're familiar with from life so like yeah those three guys are just amazing yeah okay. and Louis Barrero said Andrea Del Sarto and Hi, Louis. That's brilliant because I've been talking about ovoids and Del Sarto is the sphere. He's yeah. like the perfect sphere. The shoulders, the, I mean, everything with Del Sarto is just like a globe. So, yeah, yeah so, I love Del um, Sarto too. Um, Sorry. Uh, um, 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 Luis also um, uh, asked, um, um, sp 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 um, Luis also asked um, specifically to Noah um, um, uh, about what he, um, 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 what you what you think of um, El Greco's vision? So we mentioned um, El Greco um, earlier, and I feel like he had a sort of, uh, you know, a sort of elongated, um, you know, vision, which is I don't know, it's you know somewhat related to um, to um, to um, to um, to um, it's it's uh, somewhat related to. Um, um, Pontormo, who we were just talking about, but there's yeah, there's definitely something a lot different there. So what 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 do you think about um, El Greco and how he how he saw things? Yeah, it's it's been suggested that that El Greco had astigmatism, and um, um, I don't know if I buy that. I mean, I've looked mm -hmm. at El Greco a lot up close, and um, he's intentionally. Um, He's intentionally creating a, a false sense of elongation. Everybody looks at mm. El Greco and goes, "Oh my God, he elongates his figures." Measure El Greco's figures; they're still seven and a half heads tall. Really? <laughs> so okay. he's he's intentionally altering the height to width relationships of the forms mm. with, and I intentionally is the term is the right. key, and I think he's doing it with the goal of saying. 
this subject matter depicted in my painting is, is um, of us, but it's not us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's the idea that, uh, that man is made in God's image. And, you know, most mm -hmm. of El Greco's work is going to be religious and subject matter, but he also mm -hmm. goes into Greek mythology as well. And so it's the idea of portraying divinity. Mm. You know? And beautiful. so how, yeah. how do you portray divinity? We want, it, we want divinity to look like us, but we also want it to be greater than us. And so mm. one device that's been used um, by mannerists like uh, everybody that's been mentioned so far, um, Pontormo, Andrea del Sarto, uh, not so much Bronzino, but, um, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, Michelangelo and Parmigianino, um, they have a specific intention behind their proportional uh, logic of the figure. And um, so I think with, the, with El Greco, I think he's got a whole um, intention behind the style of his, the way he portrays the figure. Mm -hmm. And- it makes uh, a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's but I, I love, uh, you guys took all the good answers as far as the influences <laughs> go, because I'm a big fan of Pontormo. And I, um, one of my favorite places in Florence is Chiostro dello Scalzo. And it's, uh, it's a small cloister of frescoes that are just painted in sepia and white. And they're actually painted by both Andrea del Sarto, who's the, you know, the lead artist on the project, and his assistant, Pontormo. So, um, and, and as you look at the wall, you can go through each figure and say, okay, that's Pontormo. That's oh, Andrea my Del God. Wow. And it's one of my favorite. Lovely. It, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one of the best gems in Florence. One of the reasons is that the tourists don't know about it. And um, they also are really sympathetic to artists. So if you show up, they will pull out a bench for you to sit on. Really? And, and I went last summer, I was there, and they even pulled out fans for us. They put fans <laughs> on us while we were drawing. Wow. So we were all drawing from Pontormo right off the wall, you know? Oh, my yeah. God. And, um, so, but yeah, so those are, those are, um, uh, really big, big influences and, and favorites. And, um, you know, I, it's cliche, but I have to, I can't get away from, you know, a deep seated love of Da Vinci. And I think yeah. it's because he it was kind of, it's like the first book that was given to me when I showed any kind of promise in making art, somebody slapped, uh, Kenneth Clark's, uh, Leonardo Da Vinci book. Um, mm -hmm. on me and I, and I started copying the drawings out of it and, um, and especially Da Vinci's drawings, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. really haunting and, and, uh, you know, and he's doing a unique thing. He, he's different than Michelangelo and Pontormo, you know, he was a Florentine just like them, same period, but it's like, you know, he was really, he broke apart and said, yeah, but I'm really interested in optics. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I really want to know, it's not just about the muscle and the bone it's about what is the light doing and what is the science of light mm -hmm. and i think that you know michelangelo and pontormo were more were more interested um in the forms of the figure the anatomy of the figure stylizing the figure um but da vinci had his own thing going on that made him unique and so yeah i think he's you know even if i feel like i go through fads where i'm really into so and so I think I mean, she's always there at the heart of it well, uh, for me. I, I, um, I, I like the way that you um, describe um, Da Vinci's interest because, uh, you know, me being a sculptor, I just, I've never uh -oh. been into him at all. I, I've, I've always been, right. you know, way more drawn to, you know, somebody like Michelangelo, but, sure. uh, but yeah. that, that's, you know, that's just because I like to make things in clay and, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, 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 um, I think that's a fantastic, um, 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 I think that's a fantastic, um, explanation. I hadn't, hadn't quite considered, uh, that perspective. So. Who don't you guys yeah. like? Yeah. Anybody uh -huh. you don't like? Cause, <laughs> because, uh, I like to, I like, I like to hate lots of people. So I want to hear uh, who other people hate. I usually get in trouble because I don't part. like anything. That's the fun yeah. part of the Yeah. Now the comments <laughs> section in the chat's gonna blow up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, um, I really, uh, let me first let me say because we brought them up before the Rococo artists. Um, mm -hmm. They, Watteau and Fragonard and Boucher have some of the best figure drawings I've ever seen. So, so let's say that first before mm -hmm. we completely trash them. But what they did with painting is is just like, in my opinion 
is horrendous. I mean, I'll say like the Frick collection is, is one of my favorite places in New York City. Mm -hmm. And there's one room in the Frick that I don't care to go in. Oh, I know. Dragon Art Room. Mm -hmm. And I and I I almost just like don't ever go there at all. And if I do, it's quickly, you know, just passing through it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I really don't care for the Rococo uh, painters, at least what they did with painting. Yeah, well, um, I will share that uh, Lauren and I were at the Ringling Museum on Sunday. And, uh, I, um, um, and um, I think when we hit uh um uh um and i think when we hit a rococo gallery um i heard uh, um i heard lauren say oh this is rococo let's get out of here and uh <laughs> so um i i um i think you're uh you're in good company noah <laughs> and also that's a great museum too the Ringling in sarasota yeah. that's that's pretty phenomenal and and again like you said noah like their drawings are good but the paintings are like <laughs> the, the, I, I, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw a controversial one out there. I am, um, I am not a huge fan of Vermeer. I can appreciate him fully, but, um, I'm just, it just, and it's not because, you know, he, again, we were talking about people who may have worked from cameras and, you know, and his whole use of the camera obscura. It's because even despite that, no matter what the light looks like in Northern Europe, the paint just looks goopy to me. It's blobby. <laughs> it's blobby. There's no, um, and I understand not everything's going to be crisp. Again, we were talking about working from a photo and cameras do tend to create a lot of really sharp, flat edges. But something about for me, I just always want to push that value range a little bit more and just tighten some things up. I don't know. I, I think I, I, that's, that's my, that's my, that's the one that if I say people are like, oh my God, Vermeer, God Vermeer, Saint Vermeer. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, no, it's human. interesting how we, yeah. I mean, yeah. The things that get put up on pedestals are really interesting and you know, they do change over time. So it is something to keep was not a big component of what he did if he ever did any drawing at all and maybe he should have tried <laughs> maybe he should have tried yeah well, then i'll leave it at that yeah that makes sense <laughs> so um so we are uh, wait, wait at... gabriella's got to answer yeah i was going to give her the option i was going to say you know that we've gone an hour 35 and if she doesn't want to you know expose herself to this sort of you know abuse that that you know that we all are by you know talking about you know the famous artists that we hate uh that that you know she's free to do so but uh i i just you know i just wanted to you know give you the option since we're running a little late here it's up to you yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm aware of, of the time and uh, I feel like the people that I legitimately dislike are much more modern people that are alive, <laughs> whose work, I mean, and I don't know, I'm, maybe I should just like, <laughs> well, that's great. another time. That All right, is. well, no, well, that, that, um, so, um, um, actually, um, we do have, uh, um, one more question. We'll make this our last question, but, um, um, but, um, Kim Power asks, um, uh, she's interested in, um, uh, she's interested in what contemporary artists you are looking at in drawing. So that, you know, that touches on that idea of, you know, the contemporary people. So, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, contemporary people that you don't like. So let's, let's, uh, <laughs> uh cause that's a little too dangerous. So, um, uh, who are the contemporary people that you do, um, that you do like, is there somebody that you think maybe should have been on this panel? Or... Um, th there's actually, um, I'm not sure if this is the same Alfonso we were talking about earlier. Uh, is Alfonso Dunn? D-U-N-N? -N? Uh, this is Alfonso Soriano. Um, um, because, oh, okay. But c because there's this, this guy on Instagram that, uh, he, what is, what is this? He works in like, it, it's pen work mm -hmm. and he works with colored inks and, um, he just has uh, an incredible work. Um, I mean, and he's he's a contemporary artist. He's a mm -hmm. draftsman, and he's alive, and he's great. And uh, cool. he just, um, I mean, I don't want to like put my phone up to the screen because it's gonna make me feel like an old person or something. <laughs> um, but but it's like, 
but uh, he just has he just has really amazing really he just has really amazing work it's alfonso a l p h o okay alfonso and last name dunn d-u-n-n he okay. has this just uh incredible ink work in just lovely colors of ink also i mean it, mm -hmm. it's the pens that uh, uh you don't dip them it's the other ones that um i don't know what anything is called <laughs> um <laughs> Um, you like screw them okay. and then they yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't know the proper name early, um, mm -hmm. um, either. Is that a fountain pen? Fountain that... pen. Fountain oh, pen. okay. 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 Interesting. Okay. Uh, and, um, Kim is adding that, um, Alfonso Dunn went to the New York Academy. So that's where we all graduated from. Yes. So awesome. yeah, Hi, Kim, by the way. Thought. Don't look up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I know Kim. Kim is awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, um, 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 Noah, anybody, um, anybody who's um, caught your eye lately that you're um, looking at? Yeah, it's, in terms of drawings, um, I've, I've for a number of years I've been really uh, blown away by Colleen Barry, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I just I often look at her work and I. I think like, how do you get that good? And um, she's kind of the, you know, she's one of the only ones out there where I, I stop and just, you know, kind of feel it on a visceral level. Um, the, I feel the hit of it and just how incredible her drawings are on so many levels. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is uh, Amaya Gurpide. And uh, I think her drawings are really mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, both of those um, artists, um, also do beautiful paintings and I love their paintings too but as far as I guess we're just looking at drawings um, those two um, I feel like there's something really special and just above you know and setting a bar for all of us um, and um, yeah so I, I often get a lot of inspiration and humility <laughs> when looking mm -hmm. at their work mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know that I know either of them, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of research now. Mm -hmm. Lauren, who are you looking at? Um, well, I have, I have two in mind. Um, the first is a woman named Sherry Wheat, C-H-E-R-I, and then Wheat spelled like wheat. She's actually married to Ted Schmidt. So full disclosure, Ted was my thesis oh. advisor. And um, Sherry kind of takes a bit of neoclassicism and fractures it a little bit but she also makes sculptures so again she really thinks about what she's creating as something which volumetrically projects into space so it's interesting because um uh, alonso soriano was talking about these concepts of like the ideal versus the unique and alfonso or alonso i'm sorry when you mentioned that i immediately thought of sherry's work because i see her as syn synthesizing the two together um, she does a lot of really beautiful things with color washes and, and lines that that get tight and then just kind of dissipate. And for the same reason, um, especially the line work, I love Rob Plater, He's another NYAA graduate, and his work is a little bit more, I, I would say, urban inspired. He's done a lot of murals and things around New York, but his line work is unbelievable. And like, if you want a lesson in line weight like look look up i think on instagram he's at tmo plater but i've i've admired rob's work for a really long time and is, is that that's christina's yep. yeah yes he, he can draw oh my god his, his work is amazing Damn. like his line Damn. work is just like what i know it's it's like i want i want to see him do something like um like woodblock prints or something like the the, the line that that translate he's just it's it's incredible it's incredible so again how sherry kind of synthesizes like the ideal and the unique and then how rob just handles line is really really unbelievable to me really i mean just i, I look at both of their work and i'm just you know just like you know again it's that's interesting really because because I, I feel like I feel like they kind of complement each other in the sense. I mean, from because mm -hmm. I mean, I looked at Sherry Wheat's work, and I mean, I know Rob's work. Yeah. Uh, I own his work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it's Lucky like you. He's, he's, <laughs> yeah, I'm really 
pride myself because it's like I mean I I have been able to uh, that's besides the point the thing is that uh Ra's work he just it's like almost exclusively linear but with yeah with the line weight he's able to you know with that line weight he's I mean the, like the relationship between the line weights in the drawing he's able to convey just like this complete gratifying finished image and so mm-hmm. like the uh, Sherry Weed I just looked it up it's just like she's hardly linear at all it's like there yeah. is like some line there but it's not like the main protagonist of the work it's like there's also smudges there's like smears mm-hmm. and there's like all this smoky stuff looking on there and it's just like mm-hmm. really it's like yeah like what we were talking about earlier it's like it, uh, everybody's language is like so obviously just like splattered all over yeah. the all over the page you know it's pretty mm-hmm. great yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so that, yeah. that covers the again like i i like work that um you know, I can't think of many like silver point artists when you ask me if, like that's terrible. Maybe, you know, it's it's uh, it's hitting too close to home, but I you know, what I like tends to be very very different than and 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 Rob's work again is kind of why I I, I if I won Powerball and just had all the time and money in the world to do whatever the hell I wanted, I would be like, okay, I want a proper print shop. I want to get into etching. Um, I want to get into lithography, you know, again, the way line work mm-hmm. translates from th- from something like silver point and, and you can't see in the drawing um, behind so well, but it's all it's all hatch marks the whole thing. And um, and so doing so, like an etching plate is very it's a different surface and the burin is different. And I know it's you know, it's going to be a mirror image later on. But the language is the same. I can maintain my handwriting. Mm-hmm. I can maintain yeah, my yeah, handwriting yeah. going from one yeah, medium yeah. to the next. So um, it's, it's uh, Daryl says, Lauren, who's the other artist you mentioned? Ted, uh, Sherry Wheat, C-H-E-R-I, and then Wheat, um, W-H-E-A-T, um, she's, maybe Cheryl, she goes by Cheryl also. Um, but yeah. No, well, on Instagram is Sherry, uh, is that? C-H-E-R-I, okay. yeah, awesome. Sherry Wheat. Yeah. Awesome, fantastic. Well, um, wait a minute, Brett. Who don't you like, real quick? Oh, geez. Um, I let's see. I off. Well, uh, in terms of, let's see. Uh, let me let me think drawing. about that for a minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we got I, a sculptor. Yeah. Thing. So I was about to uh, offer that I uh, don't like Rodan uh, just because that's the person I usually kind of default to 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 uh, to piss people off. Uh, <laughs> That I just I, I just I just don't get into him, um, but um, in terms of drawing, I, I um, yeah I'd have to think about that for a minute. Jeez, mm-hmm. you, um, yeah you caught me off guard here. Now you know how it feels. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, gee, yeah, I I um I guess uh, I let's see who's who's drawing that um uh, yeah who's drawing. Uh, don't I like? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna look across our studio to our bookshelf and see if there are any drafts people up there. Um, uh, I was just um, you know Wayne Tebow makes nice drawings. Yeah, well I um, uh, I was just uh, I was Wayne just Tebow, um, like the the pie man uh, pie cake man. <laughs> yeah, um, nice we 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 have um, um, we do have a Wayne Tebow book on our. Um, um, on our bookshelf, and that's what I was thinking about. I was just, uh, um, uh, I was just criticizing him um, last week um, um, with a student who uh, I'm working with uh, with um, drawing, and uh, it just you know I'm all about form, and I just can't you know get away from that. So when I see you know Wayne Tebow, who is a fantastic artist who I really like, I was looking at one of his figurative drawings, and it's just all these kind of straight lines that had nothing to do with the form underneath and it just it just made me kind of mad and i had to i had to, I had to put him down in front of my student and i felt i felt a little bad because he is a fantastic artist but uh yeah i i just i'm a, yeah i'm a stickler to form and that's part of why i um appreciate um all of you um you know all three of you so much because you really you really do get that form and you know as a sculptor that you know that gets me excited that's why that's why it's um it's good to have the viewpoint of a sculptor as well which is why i wish we we originally wanted harvey citron to be here tonight unfortunately Mm, that didn't work out but um we have to figure out a way to to get harvey to speak about draftsmanship you know going from 3d to 2d and everything which happens in between So. so Well, uh, I think um, I think that is uh, the end of um, 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 
Um, I think that is uh, the end of our panel. Um, I just want to thank everybody who tuned in. Um, we had an awesome time hanging out and getting to talk to these two. Mm -hmm. uh, so make sure you give our channel uh, a, or you know make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to the channel that would be a huge help we do have these panels every once in a while and uh we're you know we're just excited to be able to you know connect with the people that we miss from you know our you know days in new york and you know, other places and to uh, you know people you know that we've met along the way uh we we're we're you know just really excited to get to have these sorts of conversations with lots of different people. So uh, if you want to hear more, make sure you follow us and uh, make sure you follow Noah and um, Gabrielle. Um, links to them should be in the description of this video. So uh, um, um, thank you both and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Really enjoyed Thanks, being guys. here. Thanks, Lauren and Brett, for mm. hosting this. And oh, I, was, I was feel honored to be a part of it. Uh, it's been awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank you for everything.